Hi guys, welcome to Cisco Nate. So as always, uh, this video is going to be pretty comprehensive and it's going to be on a tier above most of the other videos I've made so far. So the video today is about configuring an ASA for always on VPN with a client using certificates only for authentication. And so this is going to cover everything from uh, configuring an ASA fresh out of the box to connect to smart licensing, to use strong encryption so you can SSH into it, to generate a certificate with the proper key usage fields enabled for both the ASA as well as the client. And I'm gonna do it in the simplest fashion possible. So as much as possible, I'm gonna use just facilities that are on the ASA itself. There is one key component that I cannot complete on the ASA because it requires key usage fields that are not generated by the local certificate authority. But for user enrollment, user certificates, that will all be done on the ASA. This is a really exciting video. I hope you guys stick with it and see what happens. All right, guys, as you might expect for this video, uh, it is quite a comprehensive configuration we're doing here, so there are quite a few requirements. Uh, number one is you need an ASA. In this case, I'm using a Firepower 2100 running ASA code. Second thing is you need the software. And in this case, you're going to be needing AnyConnect, ASDM, and the ASA code. Now, if you already have your ASA running and configured, great, but I'm going to show you how to take a fresh ASA freshly installed and build it up from the ground up all the way to the end point of having a successful always on VPN using certificates. You also need access to the internet and that is to download your software. And in order to download your software, you're going to need a CCO ID and that CCO ID is going to have to be linked to the correct contracts and those contracts will have to have the correct entitlements to allow you to download the software. Now, if you don't have a CCO ID or don't know what that is, stop now, reach out to your PSS or CSS or even your TSA, that's what I am, at Cisco and ask them to set one up for you or get your contracts and entitlements in order. Once you have all of those, you're good to go. You will also need a smart account and a virtual account. And that is because this ASA is going to need to reach out to licensing to make sure you can do what you're trying to do. If you don't have a smart and virtual account or you don't know what that is, again, stop, reach out to your PSS or your CSS or your TSA at Cisco and get that set up for you before you come back to this video. Uh, the last few things you need is access to a PKI certificate authority server and you need to be able to generate certificates using that server uh, or have an administration or group that does it for you but you need access to be able to do that now so that you can complete this configuration as shown in this video last thing you need is dns and that's because you need to point to dns that matches the certificate name in order to successfully validate this connection between the end client and the asa so that about sums it up. Uh, obviously you need some sort of console access into this device. I'm going to start off with a terminal server console connection and then migrate over to an SSH connection via the newly configured interfaces. So let's get to it. All right guys, so this is gonna be rather long-winded. Um, some of the software might take a little while to download. So as usual, I'm going to start with heading over to software.cisco.com logging in with my CCO ID so that I can download the appropriate software I'm going to need for this video. <laughs> so I'm gonna log in here with my CCO, go through two-factor authentication as always. And then what we're going to be looking for here is the AnyConnect Secure Mobility Client. Now, because I've downloaded the software before, it shows up here under my previous downloads. If you've never done this before though, you wanna come down here to this product name and search for AnyConnect. And if you click on any of these, it will bring you to the appropriate place. But the more generic the name is, AnyConnect Secure Mobility Client, the further up the breadcrumb train you will be and the further down you'll have to navigate later. So I clicked on Secure Mobility Client, now I have to double click on the breadcrumb 4.0. All right, I'm gonna go ahead with the latest release, which is 4.8.03052. Now you don't have to, but that's what I am using. And I'm not gonna be enabling any kinds of bells and whistles on this, uh, except for always on. Uh, you could be doing posture, you could have uh, a start before login module, but that's not what I'm doing here. I'm just showing you how to get it up really fast. And for that, you're going to need a few things. Uh, number one, you're going to need the AnyConnect software on the client computer already. And uh, so what you want to download for that is the pre-deployment package. And in my case, I've got Windows already, but you would want to download this software for each and every type of client you are going to have. So I'm going to navigate to the Windows pre-deployment package. 
which is right here, and download that. And that is going to be used to install AnyConnect on my workstation. And then I'm also going to download the AnyConnect head-end deployment package. And that allows you to uh, install the software on the ASA so that it can deploy the software to users who need it. All right, so I started those downloads. It might take a little bit. Uh, this one already finished, so things are moving pretty quick. Uh, but that is all we have to do here in terms of the software that we're going to be using. <coughs> so I'm going to go ahead and close this down. I'm going to minimize it because we'll have to come back here in a little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and install those packages, which then went my, to my downloads folder. Now I'm going to use the pre-deploy package. That's the one that allows you to install it right now on a client machine. And I am going to just go ahead and install the core VPN. That is the core component that we are going to need to do everything we want here. Now the way you do that is instead of running the separate MSIs, you just double click on setup.exe. And this is kind of a wrapper script that just kind of asks you the questions. I'm going to uncheck everything else, but what I will leave enabled here, and what I would recommend for you guys is always leave the diagnostic and reporting tool enabled. This is very useful because it helps you determine what is wrong with your install if you happen to have screwed something up. You can look at the logs generated through this to figure things out. Okay, so I've got the package now installed on my workstation. And once I launch it, you will see it in the bottom right hand side. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and leave that. I've got AnyConnect installed. Along with AnyConnect being installed, it gives you a bunch of other icons uh, like the VPN profile editor. Uh, and we will be using that later. So make sure you have the VPN profile editor and you should be good to go. All right, I'm going to head back to my putty client now. And we're going to log into a freshly installed and completely unconfigured ASA. In this case, I'm using my terminal server and a console connection. So I'm going to log into my terminal server here. And then we're going to show host, connect to my Firepower 2100. <clears throat> and once I'm logged into my Firepower 2100, you end up landing in the FXOS. Now, if you're on an ASA, you're already at the ASA command prompt. I have to go one extra step. But don't mind me, this will work on your appliance regardless whether it's Firepower or ASA. Now, since I'm on Firepower 2100, it dropped me into the FXOS prompt. I'm just gonna type connect ASA. You can do the same thing if you're in a similar boat. Now I'm at the command prompt as if I just connected a console cable, much like any of you with an appliance. I type enable, it's the first time, so we're gonna have to enable, create an enable password. Now there's a few things that we have to do pretty quick here on the initial login to this ASA. Uh, console is never a nice thing to use whenever you're trying to configure things. It's very slow to respond. Um, the one good thing is it's always there. But outside of that, uh, uh, TFTPing or FTPing files takes forever. There's a whole bunch of issues. So the first thing I'm going to do is go into config T. And if you know the way an ASA is initially configured, it has an initial outside interface configured as DHCP and an inside interface on 192.168.1.0 slash 24. So I'm going to go to my outside interface, Ethernet 11, int E11, and type IP address, and I'm using an IP addressing scheme that I already have. Now you would have one yourself, and I'm going to go ahead and put in the outside interface IP that I want this to have. All right, now that should override the old outside interface IP, and I want to make sure it's not shut down. Now the security level should already be there and at zero and it should already be configured with a name if called outside. So I'm going to now navigate to Ethernet 1.2 which is my inside interface. It's already got a name if inside. It's already got a security level 100 and I'm going to go ahead and give it a new IP as well. 168.195.1 now all of this is pertinent and customized to however you have configured your uh, network. And, and so this is gonna have to be something that you have to divine uh, when you're trying to configure your ASA. But for me, the outside is 194.7, the inside is 195.1. Okay, now that I've got the interfaces configured, the next thing I need to do, and the most important thing I need to do, is verify that routing is good using those interfaces and IPs 
and DNS is good. And that's critical because smart licensing uses them. So I'm going to go back to global config mode and I'm going to type route outside 0000000 and I'm pointing it to my outside interface gateway. This verifies or configures so that I can reach the outside world. The inside is already taken care of. It's a local slash 24 subnet and I want to go ahead and verify that this route is indeed working. So I should at this point, if I've set things up correctly, be able to ping 8.8.8.8. And this is my DNS server of choice. Now DNS is not configured correctly to reach 8.8.8.8. Uh, by default, most of these ASAs are configured to reach out to umbrellas, open DNS, and that is okay. So at this point, my routing to open DNS should also be good. I should be able to test pinging www.google.com. Now, as long as my routability is good, which we did with the default route, your DNS should also be good with the default open DNS entries. I know my routing and DNS are now good. I performed those two checks. So now I can configure smart licensing. So I'm going to go config T, license smart, register, ID token. And this is where we need to jump back out to our software.cco.com. I now need to go to my smart software licensing. With your CCO ID, your smart account, which is up here on the right-hand side, and your virtual account, which will be right here once you've clicked on inventory, you need to navigate to your specific virtual account. Now I'm on a joint smart account, so there's quite a few, but this is now my specific virtual account. And I need to have a valid token for doing this registration. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this from the ground up and click create new token. This is my ASA always on VPN token. Now I can set this to only be able to use once, used infinitely up to 30 days. I'm just gonna leave that. But the key here is you have to, or you should always have, if you're entitled to it, uh, the allow export controlled functionality checkbox. That means strong encryption, i.e. that means SSH version two with the default ciphers that are on the ASA. If you do not check this box, when you try to SSH to this ASA, it will reject the connection. And that is because it by default, it uses strong encryption ciphers. And almost every putty client out there also supports strong encryption ciphers. Now, for some reason, even though the license isn't there, it doesn't default to lower encryption. It will always choose strong encryption if it's available, even if it's not licensed. And then when it does a license check during the license connection, it will break and fail. Always look for that if you have issues SSHing to your device. With that out of the way, I'm gonna go ahead and copy this token. And we're gonna go back to our ASA and enter that token. Okay, now at this point, it is reaching out to the smart licensing server and registering this device. And now that it is doing that, I'm going to try to enable the features that I need. So from here, we type license smart and hit enter. Then we type feature tier standard. Now this is just your normal, I am an ASA doing ASA things. The second thing you wanna do is enable feature strong encryption. And strong encryption will then allow you to use the higher level uh, encryption ciphers for your SSH and other things like IPsec. So given that, I'm gonna hit end right. And we're just going to check our status of the show licensing, doing show license all. And I'm gonna keep doing that till I see, okay, it is successfully registered, that's great. It's on the right smart account, the right virtual account. And further down here, we can see that the license usage is ASA standard and strong encryption. Everything is great. We verified that is good. Now we're gonna move on to the rest of our configuration, which is, in this case, enabling the web interface of the ASA, i.e. the ability to use ASDM and enabling SSH so that we can get faster connection and response times. So I'm gonna go ahead and say SSH 000000. Now you wouldn't do this normally. This is the ACL that's applied to allow SSH on whatever interface I specify here. Now in this case, I'm gonna access from the outside. So allow SSH from anywhere, quad zeros, uh, on the outside interface. I'm gonna do the same thing for HTTP. Allow anybody to ASDM into this device. Now, you probably would wanna be a little more specific, but for the sake of configuring this, this is what I'm doing here. <coughs> so we've enabled SSH, we've enabled HTTP. The next thing we need to do is, if we want to allow people to actually log into this device, I need to configure a username. 
So username, Cisco Nate, password, privilege, 15. Okay, with that out of the way there, I now have a username, but that's not good enough. The next thing we need to do is type AAA authentication. <coughs> SSH console, and we're gonna go for a local authentication. Now you wanna repeat this a few times for each of the different things you're going to be using. In this case, it's SSH, HTTP, and enable are the three biggest ones right now. All right, so I've enabled SSH, I've enabled HTTP uh, in terms of access, I've created username, I've allowed authentication. The last thing I need to do is actually turn on the HTTP server. HTTP server enable. Now, that should be just about it. I've configured the interfaces, I configured user, I configured authentication methods, uh, SSH, HTTP, enabled all of the above. I should be able to now test reachability and proper accessibility of this firebug. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch my predefined uh, connection here that goes to 192.168.194.7. Um, oh, that is going to use the wrong username, so I'm gonna clear that. Good thing was I got a connection, so we know strong encryption is working. I'll go ahead and change this to use Cisco Nate. Change the password, and okay. Bam, there we go, I'm in. And I have enabled privilege, this is perfect. All right, so I verified, I configured the ASA uh, initially, and I have access to the device. Now the next thing we're gonna do is let's log into the ASA using our ASDM. And we're using ASDM because it does allow us to do quite a few things uh, a little more seamlessly than other methods, including kind of bootstrapping the IPsec Ike V2 certificate only always on VPN connection. Now, if this is your first time ever connecting to this ASA um, and you're using the OpenJRE uh, ASDM launcher, it may take a significant amount of time for it to update. And by significant, I mean like 10, 11 minutes for the first push of that software. I have no idea why it takes that long, but what I will tell you is if it takes a very long time, you should go clear your Java cache. For some reason, that is a known issue that slows down the loading and or downloading of the ASDM client. Clear your Java cache before doing this, otherwise it might take you a little bit longer than you really wanted to. Now, the ASDM is by no means uh, fast. It still takes a while to do everything, so there are gonna be quite a few pauses, quite a bit of time here. Get a coffee, enjoy yourself while you're watching this. So I'm gonna let this finish loading. And the first thing I'm gonna do, as always, is I try to take care of all the software stuff first. So I'm going to upload my AnyConnect clients as my first step here before doing anything else. <coughs> Once I can do that, of course. Da da da, we got a configuration. Uh, actually, you know, first thing I'll set up a device name. We're gonna call this Cisco Nate, FB2K, ASA, Cisco Nate.local. That's my name and my domain. I'll hit apply, send. So I've set the name of the device. This is very important as the certificate, certificate should match this along with the DNS. Um, and then I will go to remote access VPN, network client access, and AnyConnect client software. Now, one of the things that might trip you up is if you've already use this ASA before, when you do a write, erase, and a reload, some of these other configurations and vestigial components will still be, a, be there, such as software still loaded into Flash. Don't be surprised if you, or you reformatted an ASA or you write, erased it, and you go to add and it says, hey, there's an image that already exists here. It can happen, that's okay. There's also an issue with a local certificate authority. If you created one before and you come back after write, erase, reload, uh, it will look and it'll kind of bug out. Now, I'm gonna show you what that looks like later here and how to fix it. Uh, but essentially, you need to issue a command that ASDM will not issue, which is to clear the crypto um, CA server. All right, so I'm just waiting for the directory to load here. We're gonna go pull my AnyConnect client, the latest one, 4803052. We want the head end, which is the web deploy. 
uh, package, and that would be this one here. Web deploy canine package. So we're going to select that and say upload file. Now it's probably going to tell me it already exists. We'll see. Either way, we're going to upload this file. Now purposely don't try not to pan away unless it's an excessive amount of delay or waiting because I want you guys to see everything. So here's that error I told you about, even though I did a write erase reload and nothing shows up here, it indeed does find that image. I'm gonna say overwrite it anyways. And this is going to take a little bit here. Now it's not too bad. You can see it's already one meg out of 72 megs. Well, it's half a meg out of 72 megs, but it'll get there. So we're just gonna wait that out, let it upload. I'll probably speed this portion up, but I will not pan away from it. Whew, that was a marathon. Okay, so that file is now done loading onto the ASA, and we're going to set the regular expression match to match the client OS that we want this image to run on. So in the case of the Windows image I just loaded, uh, for my system, it's identified as Windows NT, so that's under the uh, user agent. We're going to drop that down. This is the Windows, so I'm going to go to Windows NT as the regular expression. If you happen to have the uh, CE version, you can do that, but 99% of you are going to have Windows NT. Hit OK. So now it says, all right, when I see a client connect, if it's Windows NT, this is the AnyConnect client I want to shove down into it. So the next thing we want to do is then uh, create and configure the profile that we're going to use. So I'm going to go ahead and hit apply here just to make sure that gets pushed. <clears throat> and then we're going to go back to our, our desktop of the workstation and create the always on VPN profile that we're going to be using and then upload that as well. I just have to wait this out. Oh my gosh. Uh, you won't let me minimize. All right, you know what, while that is happening, I'm going to Windows D will minimize the client typically. Oh. It won't even work for this. That is so sad. All right, I'll wait. I'll wait, ASDM. All right, so we'll minimize that. We'll go and we'll launch our profile editor. Now, I always like to run this as administrator. That way you don't run into permissions issues. So hit yes. And I'm going to go ahead and start from the ground up. Most of the defaults are okay. You want to check the normal Windows certificate stores. Now you could get fancy here later on and say, I just want to check the machine or just the user. I'm just going to have it check the stores in general. Um, I'm going to go to preferences. We're going to let automatic detection work. We're going to use an automatic VPN policy. This is the always on uh, kind of section so technically this is the automatic VPN where it detects whether you're on a trusted or not trusted network always on is down here and we'll configure that trusted network policy disconnect this means when it thinks you're on a trusted network it does not try to connect the VPN and that is what 99% of you want we're gonna leave that default untrusted network means when you're on an untrusted network as deemed by can I see a DNS domain or DNS server then connect the VPN if I'm not. So what I'm going to do here is, in this case, I'm gonna look for just the DNS domain ciscoNate.local. And I'm using just the domain because that's easy to manipulate. I still wanna use my DNS, I only have one DNS server here. So if I put that IP for my DNS server, it would see that I, I'm already connected to DNS and think I'm already on the trusted network when I'm really not. So you could do both. I could say, look for my domain suffix, under my IP configuration settings, or, and uh, look for my DNS server IP. But in this case, I'm just gonna look for the suffix. All right, further down, I'm gonna check the always on. Uh, because this is just kind of testing and stuff, I'm gonna say uh, allow VPN disconnect, that will allow me to shut it off. And the connect failure policy is currently set to closed. Now, I'm gonna move this to open, and that just means, so like, if, if I somehow configure something wrong, I will still actually be able to uh, connect to the internet and do other things. It won't lock me down. You want to have this 
closed in general, but I tend to put it open while I'm configuring everything. I test it and then I shift it to closed. All right, and everything else we can leave as normal defaults right now on that part two of the preferences. Next thing we're gonna move on to is certificate matching. And this is important because in a typical enterprise, you don't just have one certificate on your box. You've got a few machine certs, you've got a few user certs. You need AnyConnect to be able to serve up the correct certificate for this authentication. And in this case, I'm gonna do that by looking for a certificate that is issued by my CA, my Certificate Authority CA. So I'm gonna go issuer CN, and I'm gonna look for, in this case, the certificate that I'm issuing to my users is gonna come from my ASA. And my ASA's name, why did that just pop up? My ASA's name is Cisco Nate dash FP2K dash ASA. Now it's important to note here that if your distinguished name is longer overall than 30 characters, you will not be able to search for an exact match. So my exact match CN is actually Cisco Nate FP2K ASA dot Cisco Nate dot local. But this actually results in 34 characters. And you'll find this out later if you try to actually save this. It will tell you that it is too long when you're looking at the debugs for why the certificate failed. So don't test this. Just go ahead and if it's longer than 30 characters, drop it down below that. And I'm going to use a wildcard match. I know this is the name of my CA that is issuing the user certs. I'm going to uncheck match case because I don't know what's capital, what's not. This should be good enough to have any connect find my user certificate that was issued by the ASA. I'm going to go ahead and click OK here. Now we're going to move down the list and the last thing is the server that I want to connect to. This is my Cisco Nate FP2K ASA. This is the name of the ASA that I'm connecting to. And I'm going to go ahead and use the FQDN. ASA.CiscoNate.Local and it is okay to have anything longer than 30 characters here. Here you truly need the fully qualified domain name. And then user group, uh, I group is gonna be Ike V2 profile. Now it's important that this user group matches the actual profile you create later on down the road. And this right here is the ultimate reason why you actually need to create and pre-place this profile. The default action of any connect is to connect via SSL. If you do not try to connect via IPsec, you will not pull down the profile properly and you'll just be denied access given that we're not creating or configuring an SSL VPN on this ASA. So I'm gonna drop this down to IPsec. It is an ASA, we're gonna hit okay. Now we've configured part one, part two, certificate matching and serverless, we are done. So let's go ahead and hit save. The name of this file must be acvpn.xml. And we're gonna go ahead and save that. In this case, I'm gonna save it on my desktop, acvpn.xml. If it's not named acvpn, by default, the AnyConnect will not pick up that profile. Um, the other profiles you pull down later can be named something else, but those are the ones pushed by ASA. But for you to place one in the directory and have AS, the AnyConnect client load it, you have to name it this. I must repeat that multiple times because it will bite you if you don't do it correctly. Okay, so we created our profile for the always on, and now we need to upload it. That's under the AnyConnect client profile here. We're gonna go ahead and click there. <coughs> and once it loads, I'm going to upload that profile. This part will probably have to speed up a little bit. It's going to be very slow. All right, so this is a new, a net new AnyConnect client profile. So we need to click add. And once that pops up, then we're going to select the profile that we just placed on our desktop, acvpn.xml. 
and we're going to upload it to the ASA. Now the group policy, we will not be able to tie it to because the group policy doesn't exist yet. We're gonna walk through the IPsec Ike V2 AnyConnect wizard in a minute here to help pre-configure and pre-place a large bulk of the rest of the work we have to do. And then we're just gonna go tweak one or two things and that will include the group policy assignment for this AnyConnect client profile. Uh, it's taking a long time. Might have to speed this up as well. <clears throat> as we all know, spinning the mouse in a circle speeds things up. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and click Upload. Speed things up, speed things up, speed things up. Browse local files, and we're going to browse to that XML ACVPN profile we created. Select, upload file. Now, again, this is probably one of those files that is going to already exist because I did a write erase, and I've already used a profile on this ASA before. If it asks you that, just say yes, overwrite it with the new one you just created. There we go. Yes, I want to overwrite it. This is a very small file relative to the ASDM, so it will transfer quickly. Okay. I'm going to call this ACVPN, and you'll notice down here the profile location, the actual profile name is being changed based on the profile name you create up here. It is an AnyConnect VPN profile, so just leave that as the default. And then we're going to leave it unassigned right now for the group policy, but later we will come back and reassign this to the uh, policy that we create through the wizard. So I'm going to hit OK. We're going to hit Apply. <coughs> Send. Okay, we're finally able to move on. Now the next thing we're gonna do is manage these certificates. And the first thing I want to do is to generate the certificate that we're going to be using for the ASA itself, for identity. So I'm gonna move over to device management, certificate management, identity certificates. <coughs> then I'm gonna click add. Now the identity certificate is the certificate that the ASA uses to identify itself to the clients as they're connecting via always on VPN. I'm gonna say add a new identity certificate. I'm gonna leave it at the default RSA key, which is 2048. And we want to make this a correct FQDN, fully qualified domain name, which currently it is not. So you wanna click select, you wanna click common name, and you wanna type the fully qualified name of your device, which means the host name and the domain name. Cisco Nate.local. I'm going to add that here. Cisco Nate FP2K ASA at Cisco Nate.local. Hit OK. We are not generating self signed certificate. Now, the reason we're not doing this is because the self signed certificate, the root CA built into the ASA, unfortunately does not allow you to include key usage or enhanced key usage fields. These fields are necessary for the always on VPN to validate correctly. Even though the root CA certificate it could generate is uh, enabled for general usage for all attributes, it does not have, it doesn't even have the key usage or enhanced key usage fields. And as part of the validation for always on VPN, if it doesn't have those fields, even if it's enabled for all attributes, it fails. 
So at this point, we are done with this. We're going to go ahead and click Add Certificate. Now, this doesn't actually add the certificate. It generates the certificate signing request, which you now need to save. I'm going to call this ASA CSR on my desktop. Save. OK. All right, so I now have my ASA CSR that was generated. And I need to generate the certificate that I'm going to install. So this is where the access to the PKI uh, certificate authority is important. So I'm now going to navigate to my PKI certificate authority. 192.168.194.16, cert serve. <coughs> going to log in. Now you need to click request certificate, but you do not want to request the user certificate. We are creating a certificate for the ASA, and I've created a custom template. But the important thing for this template, which I've called ASA identity, is that it has to be used for server authentication, and it has to have that as the key usage or enhanced key usage field. If it does not, this will fail. Now that is literally the only thing this particular certificate needs, is those key usage fields and the attribute that allows it to be used for server authentication. Um, so as long as you tell your certificate authority people or you generate the template yourself uh, correctly, that's what you need. And that is what this is going to do. So I'm gonna hit submit. You wanna switch it to base64 and you want to download the entire certificate chain and here's why. The certificate authority that generates this certificate, uh, it's going to generate a chain of certificates, one is including itself in any intermediates uh, up to the root authority, and then it's going to create the certificate that you asked it for, right? And the idea is the ASA is going to present its certificate, the one you're generating here, to the client, and the client now needs to say, yes, I trust whoever created that certificate. It is very important that you download the chain because then we can pull out the root CA and any intermediate CAs and have them trusted on the client side and then put the identity certificate on the ASA. So go ahead and click download certificate chain. Now that it's downloaded, I'm going to open the certificate chain and extract all of the certificates that I need. This is the root CA. And if you had multiple, there would be more in a chain here before the identity certificate for the ASA. So I'm gonna take the root CA certificate and I'm going to export that. Base64 again. And I'm going to save it to my desktop as root CA cert. Now I don't need the private keys for this. You don't need that for either one. And I'm going to do the same thing with the ASA cert. Export 64, base 64 again. Next, ASA cert. And that is going to go on my desktop as well. Now we can finish our initial intention, which is installing the ASA certificate uh, for the identity. And we're gonna come back to our ASDM under identity certificates, hasn't changed, hasn't moved. We're gonna click install. And then we're gonna install from file and choose the ASA certificate. Now you could take the text that is in that certificate and paste it here, base64. Um, but it's just easier to select the file. So we're gonna say install certificate, send. If it is successful, you'll see that it says import succeeded. And you'll see that it has usage, general purpose, all this other stuff over here. <clears throat> now you can look at the details of the certificate here. It's not super important. It has what we need. If you really wanted to check it, this view here is not very good. You can double click the cert here and you can see that it is enabled to allow to identify it to be used for identity of a remote computer or proves your identity to a remote computer. This is the one that we actually really care about. That is server authentication. If we go to details, we should be able to see that somewhere in the key usage or enhanced key usage. Ditto signature, key encipherment. Key usage, key usage. Enhanced key usage, server authentication. This is what we're looking for here. Key encipherment is also good when you're doing VPNs. All right, so we've got that done. Next thing we're gonna do is enable the local certificate authority. And this is so that we can bootstrap um, creating certificates for our users. And actually, before we go there, let's go ahead and install the root CA certificate on the workstation so that the workstation will trust the ASA when it sees it. I'm gonna type certmgr.msc on the Windows box. File or action, all tasks.
I'm going to come down to certificates. Trusted root certificate authorities is where you want to be. Altas, import. I'm going to choose the root CA cert. I'm going to let it place it into the trusted root certificates authority store. Import was successful. So now I should be able to look here and see that my root CA is trusted. Uh, and that will allow me to trust the ASA when it presents its certificate, which was issued by the root CA. Now we'll go back to the ASA and move on with the other part. So for the user's certificates to be generated by local CA, you want to go to Firewall, Advanced, Certificate Management, Local Certificate Authority, CA Server. Now at this point, I have already at one point created a local certificate authority, and then I right erased the box and rebooted it. Now the problem is that doesn't actually remove the certificate authority. You'll notice in here, whenever I check this box and I hit apply, oh, let me do this again, and I hit apply, oh jeez. Third time's a charm. All it's going to do is no shutdown. And if I try to remove this configuration, this is just a warning because they're going to be removing this command in the future, the crypto CA server. If I uncheck this then to try to disable or remove it, it doesn't actually remove the certificate authority. All it does is shut it down. So what that leads to here, and what I'm going to show you now, I didn't push those changes, you notice is when, even though it's enabled, when I go to the Manage User Database, it will show up for a second and then blank out. And you'll be stuck thinking, what just happened? I enabled the CA and it's not working. It's simply because the Certificate Authority server was actually still configured and still running from before, even when you did a write erase reload, and now it's in this bugged out state. So log in via CLI. Go to enable mode. Config T and simply type no crypto CA server. Yes, I want to remove the local CA server. It has been removed and right. Now, ASDM should detect that a change was made. If not, I'm just gonna hit refresh here to speed things up. <clears throat> now the certificate authority server does not exist anymore and everything will be back to normal and everything will operate the way you expect. While that's happening, I'm going to minimize this window in the back again. It will probably disconnect in a minute. Okay, so at this point, the local CA server actually is not even configured. We're gonna click enable CA server. We're gonna go ahead and give it a passphrase, which you have to verify two times. Leave, uh, you can leave everything at its defaults or bump it up. I'm gonna put it at 2048 for both sides just because everything else was. Uh, nothing else needs to be touched. It should default to the CN of your box. So hit apply. Hit send. Now once it turns the CA server back on, this time when you go over to the manage user database, database, everything will work perfectly. The screen will stay up and you will be able to add and remove certificate uh, self-enrollment users at will. At this point, I should be able to come here. The screen will stay here because it's not in the bug state anymore. I click add. I'm gonna add a user called Cisco Nate. Uh, I'm going to give it siskonate at gmail.com and then the subject DN I want to be accurate about it's going to be CN and it's just Cisco Nate. Now at this point you could say things like your full name. I could say Nathan space Stapp. The name, the DN, the CN here does not actually matter at this point. This is purely an exercise of trust between the client and the server as long as the certificate your client 
Your workstation is presenting to the ASA, is issued by CA, the ASA trusts, you are good. And since the ASA is the CA issuing the certificate, it trusts it no matter what. So we're gonna go ahead and click add. I now have Cisco Nate as a common name. Click OK, allow enrollment, make sure that's checked, hit add user. Now the beauty of this design is that your users can navigate to a web page on the outside of the ASA with a one-time password, which is either emailed to them or you're giving them, and pull down their certificate. It makes it very nice. Now, if I had an email server set up here, I'd be able to just email it to them and I would be none the wiser as to what it is. But because I'm showing you guys this, I'm actually going to need to view and or regenerate the OTP, the one-time password. So I'm gonna pull that out. I will need it later. I'm gonna put it in a notepad and we're gonna save that for later. <clears throat> All right, so at this point, I've got a local CA with a certificate almost generated for the user. Um, and then I've got the ASA configured with the certificate. The last thing we need to do is uh, configure DNS. We want to point DNS at this address of our ASA, the outside interface, so that I can navigate to Cisco Nate FP2K ASA.CiscoNate.local and hit this IP. So I'm going to go ahead and RDP into my, my uh, Active Directory server that's running DNS. <clears throat> Here we go. We'll go to Tools, DNS, CiscoNate.local, and oh, look, I already got an entry. I forgot to delete it from earlier, but that's okay. Works out great. I will show you how to do this. I'm going to delete it now, and we'll just recreate it for anybody who's not familiar with DNS. New host, A or quad A record in the domain you're interested in doing this for. So I'm clicking on CiscoNate.local, right click, new host, Cisco Nate dash FP2K dash ASA dot Cisco Nate dot local. Now it is extremely important here. Sorry, this just needs to be the host name. The domain is appended below. It is extremely important that this host name and the FQDN are exact, that they match exactly what is on the CN of the certificate. Otherwise, this will not work. So just verify that. 192.168.194.7. Okay, so I've now ended a DNS entry and a pointer record uh, pointing to my ASA on the outside interface. That's it, that's all we need for DNS. So I'm now going to disconnect from my RDP session. We do not need that anymore. We're finally at the point where we get to start bootstrapping everything together. So <coughs> back to ASDM again. We're going to go ahead and go up to Wizards, VPN Wizards, Any Connect VPN Wizard. I'm going to hit Next. This is the profile name that I said earlier needs to match exactly. So what we put into the XML of the AC VPN needs to match this, which is Ike V2 Profile. We're going to say we want people to connect on the outside. We only want IPsec. And the certificate is an RSA key. We're gonna choose the trust point we created. This is the certificate that we generated earlier. We're gonna go ahead and click Next. We've already got the AnyConnect package because I uploaded that earlier. Now you could have Mac and Linux here as well or multiple versions or Windows CE, but this is all we need for now. Authentication methods. You wanna keep the authentication method as local and that is because in the end we're going to switch this over to certificate so we don't actually need to create any other new users here or anything else you can just leave it as local and that is it we're going to hit next authentication method <coughs> change that to certificate only triple a server group is local hit next now we're going to create a new address pool here and the address pool here won't really matter as long as you set up NAT address translation correctly. This can be anything. It's a virtual address pool that the VPN users get. And then if you NAT it to come from the inside of your ASA, then none of the devices on the inside of your network are any wiser to the fact that this exists as a virtual pool outside. So I'm gonna call this Ike v2 pool so that we know it's part of the Ike v2 VPN. 192.168.19, dot two one nine two dot one six eight and one nine six dot two five four five two five two 
0.0, .0. that's a slash 24 there, leaving out the gateway and the uh, broadcast address. We're going to hit OK. So now we've got our pool of addresses for the VPN. I'm going to leave, I'm going to change this to my actual inside DNS server, 192.168.194.16. Uh, and I'm going to leave the domain name Cisco name out local. Now this is significant here because when you're doing your trusted network detection, you're looking for a domain suffix, the way we set this up, Cisco local. And if you do not give your clients that domain suffix, then the VPN will continue to check and say, oh, I'm not on a trusted network and try to continue reconnecting even though it's already connected. It's not a good thing. Make sure you assign the suffix you're looking for to these clients or the DNS server that you're looking for or both to these clients. Not exempt. Now, in this particular point, I do not want this traffic exempt. If your architecture is such that you are using a virtual IP address pool that is routable throughout your entire network, yes, you can exempt this traffic. I'm actually not going to exempt it because I want it to come from the inside interface of the ASA, no matter what VPN clients are coming from. And I'm going to allow any connect client deployment web launch. This is so if people don't have any connect installed, they can connect and download any connect. Um, so it doesn't really matter. You can leave it, you can shut it off, it doesn't matter. We'll hit next, I can be to profile, and we'll hit finish. Send. Now that was a lot of stuff to configure there. <clears throat> and I'm just going to go through and do a few cleanup items. Uh, some of these are extremely necessary, some are not so much. So the first is, I like to make sure I'm a purist. I like to turn off everything I'm not actually using. So I turned off default, RA group, and WebVPN group. Uh, you want to make sure the device certificate being presented for IPsec connection is your certificate that you created, the trust point zero in this case. So yes, that is it. We're good there, I'm gonna hit okay. You wanna make sure client services and allow access for IKE v2 are enabled. Client services is what allows you to dynamically push a new AnyConnect client uh, and the profile whenever they need it. You need to make sure the enable Cisco AnyConnect VPN client access is checked here, otherwise the EAP request will not be uh, sent correctly and you will not get your certificate back as identif uh, identification for the client. Uh, so it looks like everything here is good. I'm going to go ahead and double click into my Ike v2 profile. And it is certificate only, it's local, the name is Ike v2 profile, that's good. Everything here looks good. All right, I'm going to hit OK, I'm going to hit apply. Uh, I don't know why I did anything with IPv6, but that's fine, we don't need it. <coughs> Okay, everything is still correctly configured here. Now we're gonna move on to checking the group policy that is associated with this. So there's a group policy, Ike v2, that was created. Tunneling protocol is Ike v2, that's great. Go ahead and double click on that group policy to open it up. Everything here should be the defaults. We shouldn't have to mess with anything. Again, this is quick and dirty. You can see it inherited the uh, DNS server I gave it and the DNS suffix I gave it earlier. At this point, you could, if you chose, choose to do split tunneling. Now, I'm not split tunneling. I'm just going to do a full VPN whenever I VPN in. Um, and the AnyConnect client here, it should be pointing to the correct profile. Now, this is where it does not point to the correct profile. All right, so this is the part that we need to clean up. I need to delete this client profile, and I need to add the correct profile, ACVPN, the one that I already created and already uploaded to uh, this box and hit OK, hit OK, hit apply, and now it should be using the ACVPN XML profile. And I want to come back here and make sure that it is indeed pointing to the correct profile as well. So if we go to the profile itself, we should now see it tying backwards to the group policy. So it now says it is being used, ACVPN is being used for the group policy. Now, if I say edit here, I just want to make in sure that somewhere here it should say allow always on for the VPN. This is a profile that we uploaded and the always on is still here and still configured. That's perfect. Okay, 
it looks like everything is indeed configured correctly now with the VPN. Um, the last thing we have to do is save the config, download the user certificate and insert it in my trust store on this machine, and then launch AnyConnect and see if things work. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and there's a special address that you have to navigate to on these devices on ASA to be able to pull down the user certificate. And that is HTTPS, you know, yeah, HTTPS colon slash slash Cisco Nate FP2K. It's the DNS name of your ASA plus CSCOCA plus slash enroll dot HTML. And that's actually going to redirect you quickly to a another page once you accept everything. Did I forget to change the certificate on the interface? I think I did. There we are, I forgot to change the certificate. Common troubleshooting issues. All right, so now I'm going to enter the username of the user that I created, Cisco Nate, and I'm gonna take that one-time password that I had earlier and place it in here. And I have no idea what's going on there. I keep getting extra characters. Let's go back. Nate. There we go. With the one-time password and the proper username, I've now downloaded the certificate that I need to have on this client to identify the client to the ASA. This certificate was generated by the ASA itself. So I'm going to say import certificate, current user. You can do current user, local machine. It's up to however your authority and machines are configured. In this case, I'm using the current user. Next, next. The password for this certificate is, once again, the one-time password that we already copied and I had overwritten here. And you want to mark this key as exportable. It's up to you. I always do it because it makes it easy to move or save or backup but you don't need to, you can leave it. It's less secure if you mark the key as exportable and then hit next. And then you wanna allow it to automatically select the certificate store based on the type of certificate. So hit next, hit finish, yes. Okay, now if that import was successful, you should be able to once again verify this. I like deterministic methods, cert mgr.msc. Go to the personal under certificate current users, personal certificates, and that's because that's where we imported the cert. Uh, you should be able to see a certificate for Cisco Nate. In this case, I've got two. Um, I must have used that earlier at some point, but I have the certificate with the private keys. We're good to go. All right, now I told you before that the ASA, uh, the always on AnyConnect VPN, uses your network suffix, because that's what we configured in this case, to determine whether you're on a trusted network. So if I type ipconfig slash all, you'll see that currently I have no DNS suffix and I have the DNS server. Now that's because I've manually configured these settings and I, I purposely left off the suffix so that once I launched any connect, it would not find this, it would deem this an untrusted network and it would try to establish the VPN. Now. The important thing is I have the XML template that I created before loaded on the ASA. I also have and saved that AC VPN XML here on my desktop. We now need to place it in the directory so that when AnyConnect fires up for the first time, it finds this configuration. And it is important that it finds this configuration because it will default to SSL when it tries to connect unless you have this profile. So under C, Program Data, Cisco, 
Cisco AnyConnect Secure Mobility Client Profile is where you want to place acvpn.xml. You'll need administrative privileges. There it is. Now I'm going to go ahead and close this window, and it is at this point, at the grand finale, that we should now be able to launch AnyConnect and have a successful, always-on VPN established using certificates only. And when I do, it should see that the profile for 698 fp 2 k ASA was there and identify it. Should be able to kick connect, and there's a bunch of things that are going to happen here. It's going to reach out to the ASA. It's going to check and see if it has the proper software. Uh, ASA is going to shove that software to it if it's not already installed. Now, in this case, I pre-installed the proper software, so that didn't happen. It's going to say, hey, I have a new profile for you. Even if it is the same exact profile, it's going to push the current one that it has. And your client is going to download it and then reapply that new profile. Now, why did I create a profile? Again, it's because without that profile there, I would not have attempted IPsec on the first connection. It would have been SSL, which would have failed. So literally just a bootstrap to get IPsec, and then it pulls down the new profile. After that, a ASA is going to ask, who are you? It's going to present the certificate using that certificate matching mechanism, looking for the certificate that identifies me as Cisco Nate. And then my client is going to ask the server to identify itself with a certificate that is trusted by the client. Both of those happened, and the ASA and the client successfully establish an IPsec, Ike V2, certificate only, always on VPN. Now, I'm able to disconnect this because I gave myself the option, but what you will notice is in the client down here, the option to quit disappeared, and that's because it has to always connect. And if I click disconnect here, you should see it'll say VPN connection required. And that is because currently my suffix does not have Cisco Nate dot local on it. I don't know why I just typed that. ipconfig slash all. There we go. There is no suffix Cisco Nate dot local. Now, if I wanted to truly test this, what I could do is come back here to control panel. <coughs> Network Sharing Center is I could go spoof the fact that, oh, I do have that suffix now. Now there's many more mechanisms you can use for the trusted network detection to have it really verify you're on a trust network. You can have it reach out to servers. You can have it resolve specific domain names. But this is just a simple idea of how this works. So I'm going to type Cisco Nate Local here now as my domain suffix. And now that is on my NIC. And I should be able to verify that using ipconfig slash all again. You can see I do now have that suffix. Now any connect periodically refreshes and continues to check. I can go ahead and connect manually and then disconnect and have it rerun that check. I'm gonna connect manually. Contacts the ASA, all that stuff happens again. Checks the any connect client version, checks the profile version, pushes it down. Now I still have the ability to disconnect. And now when I disconnect, it says network access available because it thinks we're on a trusted network. It has the NIC I, I have connected to this network has the domain suffix I am looking for in that profile. It's as simple as that, guys. You just configured from the ground up an Ike V2 IPsec VPN that is always on using certificates on an ASA. Over and out. Have a good one.